This is horrible advice. It's so good. It is horrible advice. It's so good. Everyone should watch this. Hey everyone, my name is Suken. I'm a managing partner at Iterative. Hey guys, this is Brian, one of the managing partners at Iterative. Today I'll be reacting to some movies and TV scenes on startups. I'm so excited. This is the social network. That's great. I have never seen drinking, uh, coding drinking games in my life. I would love it if people were cheering me on when I'm coding. <laughs> so, that is like the most unrealistic thing I've ever seen. Hollywood like needs to invent scenes like this to like make it seem exciting because probably the reality is like a bunch of dudes mainly probably dudes like sitting in like a dark room and coding is like not that interesting um and actual interview processes for kind of like working at a startup are like just not that interesting so um i think this is like a complete hollywood invention i've never seen this before i've never heard stories of this before i doubt that this has ever happened um, unless you know i guess i just didn't work at any of the cool companies or know any of the cool people that did this but it's never happened before completely fabricated Good movie, but this part was, like, totally fabricated. In fact, it's it's usually, like, the complete reverse, right? Like, you're coding, and nobody cares about you. You're, like, in the corner. <laughs> you're, like, doing your thing. Uh, most of the time, you resurface from your corner, and it doesn't work, right? And so, and people don't even know why it doesn't work or, like, what's working. They just see kind of a text <laughs> on a screen. So, yeah, this definitely never happens. I think the most exciting thing that happened at computer science kind of, like, labs when we were in school and stuff is, like, it used to be that like uh, Amazon during finals week would order like 30 pizzas to the computer science department at University of Washington because their headquarters there and they're trying to hire out of the department. And so there would be some like rogue order of 30 pizzas and somebody would come running into the room and be like, Amazon just ordered pizza, like come out now to eat it. And we were like all run out to eat pizza. But like that's about as, that's about as exciting as it kind of got there. The rest of the time it's like you have your headphones in and you're like coding, right? So this is Silicon Valley and is almost ready to merge the serverless runtime. Look, look. He implemented all those tasks by himself. But there are people that exist where this is kind of how they like to work. They just like to kind of go at something kind of like full force. Look at the coders. They're all wearing Pi Piper hoodies. He pushed another commit. That's how software engineering works. You finish something, you push a branch up to the kind of the main repository. What the fuck? Flawless, right? And they're talking about like, oh, normally when you push up a commit, somebody checks to see if the code is good or whatever. Um, it takes a while to read a whole commit. Yeah, it does take a while to look at a commit. It takes like an hour if you want to look at like a big commit. And so again, there's just like little pockets of how they talk about stuff in the show that are just like super real. Like I feel like in other Hollywood movies, they'd be like, A, they would like not talk about how they pushed up a commit. They wouldn't talk about commits at all because again, that's not interesting for most Hollywood movies. I don't think the social network talked about a commit in the entire time that the social network is there. Um, But you know, lots of girls and drugs and cocaine. Typically what ends up happening more the case, um, which has definitely happened to me and kind of like Brian and kind of a few other of us is you just sleep under your desk. Like you just get so tired that you just like crawl up under your desk and you fall asleep. And so you don't like throw up, you don't fall through like glass, you just like curl up into a ball and like sleep. And this used to happen enough at our first startup where we started keeping sleeping bags and a pillow underneath our desk in the office because this would just like happen. I remember one time um, we couldn't find my brother. Like we couldn't find him. We were like going to go eat dinner or something like that. And we were like going around trying to find Suan. We're like looking for my brother. We like can't find him. We go to dinner and we come back and he comes crawling from underneath his desk and he had like the sleeping bag completely over his head. He crawls and he's like, What's happening? And we were like, dude, we're trying to find you to dinner. We're like, where were you? And he's like, oh, I've just been like sleeping. And we just like, and he was like, you guys ate without me? And we were like, dude, we thought you left, man. And he was just like sleeping at his desk. And so like that kind of stuff kind of happens, but it's not nearly as kind of dramatic as this. Silicon Valley is more accurate than probably any other kind of like pop culture show. So much so that like 
I feel like I've only watched, I, I could only watch a couple episodes because of how realistic and relatable some of the points are. With kind of Silicon Valley as a whole, I think the biggest, the funniest thing about Silicon Valley is for people who are not in startups, it looks like an exaggeration and satire. And then for everybody in Silicon Valley, it's like, no, that's kind of how it is. And so like, I feel like that's the big inside joke is that like, we don't even have to exaggerate these stories to make a TV show. We just need to tell them how it actually is. And like, people will think it's funny. So. Um, yeah, there's a lot I can identify with in this in this clip. We're making the world a better place through Paxos algorithms for consensus protocols. And we're making the world a better place through software-defined data centers for cloud computing. I also want to make the world a better place. <laughs> Those pitches sound 100% real. Like, that's how pitches, like, sound. Um, and people often like to say kind of like, make the world a better place, put a dent in the universe to like say Steve Jobs or I don't know, move the human race forward or like any number of kind of like very broad kind of like platitudes of, you know, how they're changing the world. A lot of founders will pitch in broad, generic kind of like um, platitudes. Uh, and so we definitely see a lot of that. And I, I wouldn't be surprised if we saw that at uh, kind of like a TechCrunch stage. And we are truly local mobile social. And we're completely so mo low. And we're molo so. We're low mo so, bro. We were so low mo, but now <laughs> we're mo low so. No, mo so low. I don't know if people know the context between um, on like solo mo, right? That was like the rage uh, in, I forgot what it was, like, 2000s or something right where it's kind of like we just had cameras social local like mobile was like literally every company <laughs> every company on on the planet and so eh, I, the like seat was really well done i mean today it's probably like we are like chat gpt llm crypto what like i mean there, we have our kind of like own versions of this right so that was all kind of like super real and stuff we have a lot to do so let's get started sounds great me we would just be coming by and saying hi you know uh to pick up the check and uh i just didn't know that any of that stuff was due yet do you this is not college richard I'm not going to be giving you a course syllabus. What did I buy? You bought the algorithm, which- No! The algorithm is the product of the company. I know that. What I'm asking about is the company itself. This is going very poorly. I know. He doesn't seem to know what he's doing. The Peter Gregory character is obviously kind of eccentric. And Silicon Valley is full of kind of eccentric people like this. Um, and they're eccentric in kind of like a host of different ways. And so um, I don't find his eccentricities as like that far-fetched, to be honest. Um, they will sometimes kind of sit there and wait for you to start. Uh, they will talk about how you're doing badly to somebody else in with you. Like all this stuff is kind of like true. Um, and his line of questioning is not dissimilar to kind of how VCs are. They kind of want to get to the crux of it. And I think a lot of what he is saying is actually like correct. And like, that's how investors think. That's how I think about stuff. And so I think all of that, how he comes across is not so nice. Um, and so, you know, I think at iterative, I would personally kind of not treat people that way, but it is not uncommon for that to kind of be the case. And I don't think there's anything kind of wrong with his questions. We would just be coming by and saying hi, you know, uh, to pick up the check. And uh, I just didn't know that any of that stuff was due yet. It sounds like they had already agreed to invest in the company. And now he was like coming to pick up the check or something like that. I think that also kind of like happens sometimes is where I think founders got kind of caught off guard by kind of like what's going on and like these kinds of things. So that's again, that's like possible. Um, and I think this is kind of one of the things you learn as you kind of are entrepreneur, you become, you are founders, you meet more investors and that kind of stuff. You kind of like will go into these meetings, kind of like assuming that there's like some bit of it. I'm going to tell all founders right now, if you are meeting with a VC, there is no such thing as a casual meeting. It's not true. It doesn't happen. Like maybe in like, if it's like a group setting or whatever that like, okay, maybe, but like if you're one-on-one -on -one meeting with a, a investor, even if they say it's casual, do not treat it like a casual kind of like thing. They're going to ask you questions like, 
that's why they asked you to kind of like coffee and stuff is that because they want to know these things. I think the flip side of it too is I think also investors kind of expect you to have thought about these things before. And so like, even if I was in a casual meeting with somebody or whatever, like, Hey, why are you doing this thing? And if they don't have an answer for that, I'm like, okay, that's kind of something you should have known. Even if like you didn't prep anything, it's kind of like, why are you starting your company? Right. And so I think they are oftentimes fair questions, but founders kind of need to know that like, there's no such thing as kind of a casual kind of like catch up, but also some of these questions you should kind of know. P and L forecast of three years is ridiculous for early stage startups. You're not going to have that. And so if you go to a casual conversation and an investor asks you for a forecast of three years, like, yeah, you're not going to know that. And honestly, the investors kind of like shouldn't ask you questions like that. But if there's like basic questions like, hey, why'd you guys start your startup? Or like, I don't know, what's an interesting thing you've learned from like your customers or something like some of that should be like. You should kind of know without kind of preparing. And so it's kind of fair. One investor story that uh, I have from, it wasn't exactly like this, but it was like kind of in this vein is Brian and I went to go meet an investor once and it was a similar thing. I mean, it wasn't like a casual thing. It was like, you know, we were there to kind of meet them and they were thinking about investing, whatever. And the investor asked us some question, which was like a pretty good question. And it was like, I don't know, why do you think this is such a big problem? Or like some, some meaty kind of question. And so Brian and I, answer the question. So we're like, you know, we explain this whole thing or whatever. And the investor closes their, uh, I'll mimic out, closes his eyes and then puts his head back like this for probably like five minutes. And so Brian and I are sitting there kind of like looking at each other and literally the investor is just sitting at their desk like this for like five minutes. And Brian and I kind of look at each other like, what is happening? And then like a couple of minutes go by and Five minutes of silence at an investor kind of meeting when their eyes are closed is like, might as well be an eternity. And it's like, in, I think we're like, okay, we didn't say any of this because he was sitting in front of us, but like in our, uh, Brian and I are communicating with our eyes. We were like, are we supposed to say something? Like, did we say something that was so stupid there that this investor is like, I hope these guys leave? Or like, did we say something really smart? Like, we kind of don't know. We've never had such kind of a reaction from people before. And then finally, he kind of like sits back and he goes, okay, I get it. And we were like, oh, okay. <laughs> and then we just like, com like completed, like continued going on. I'm sorry, but typeface, it, it isn't exactly a pressing issue. If you don't share our enthusiasm and care for the vision of this company. What are you going to, you going to fire me? No. I already fired you. So I think my first reaction is, um, and I've read I've read quite a lot about Steve Jobs and kind of seen a lot of his stuff, and I read Walter Isaacson's book and all that. And uh, you know, by all accounts, uh, I don't know about this specific kind of like thing, but like by all accounts, Steve Jobs was kind of like this, right? And I think my first reaction is like, this is kind of like how Steve Jobs kind of like at least seemed to have been. Um, I think the other thing that is interesting about it and having talked to people who've kind of like worked with Steve Jobs before is that um, everybody kind of, I don't know if we can swear on this podcast, but I guess it's like our podcast or like our videos or whatever. Everybody thought he was an asshole, but they'd never been prouder of their work. And so there was this love hate relationship where it's like at the end of the day, you helped make the iPhone and it's like, you know, the achievement of your kind of professional career but he was an asshole, right? And so I think there was this cult of like, okay, you have to be able to put up with this, but you're gonna do kind of like amazing work. I think the bad thing that happened in Silicon Valley after uh, when Steve Jobs kind of became famous for this and after he passed away and stuff, then that there's like a mythos of Steve Jobs is, I think there was a lot of people that went around thinking that you needed to be like Steve Jobs in order to kind of like be successful. And they just kind of like went rogue and like did these kinds of things to people. And I think that's kind of like not happened anymore or whatever, but like, I'm sure there were many of founders who were like firing people over kind of like fonts and typeface and that kind of stuff in that time, thinking that not actually believing that that was kind of necessary, but feeling like that's kind of what you need to do and successful. This is the Korean drama startup. <laughs> This is horrible advice. It is horrible advice. I hope people didn't watch this and kind of like think that this was true or whatever, but it's horrible advice. First of all, 
you can definitely kind of split equity equally and still have a CEO. Like, for example, Brian and I have always split equity kind of like evenly, even at iterative, everything is split, like split evenly between us. And yet we still have kind of like a CEO and stuff. So to me, I think it's important to choose who's CEO and what that means and like that kind of stuff. But equity doesn't need to kind of reflect that. To give the one person 90% of the equity is like insane. Like nobody else is going to work with this person, right? Like I wouldn't work with Brian if he had 90% of the equity and Brian wouldn't work with me if I had 90% of the equity. So like if you want good people, you need to have like a more even split. This idea that one person should have 90% is just horrible. So much so that when I've looked at cap tables and I see there's three co-founders and one of the founders has 90% or whatever, I don't invest because I'm like, the other two people are not really co-founders. Like I stay away from it, right? And I'm like, why does this person think they're worth 90%? Like, have they not talked about this? Like, this is gonna cause problems later. Like, it's horrible, horrible advice. I actually advocate for the most part to try to make it super simple and make it um, equal as much as possible. The show doesn't actually understand how companies actually work because you don't get to vote based on equity. There's also this additional thing called voting rights. And so for example, Mark Zuckerberg at Facebook does not own a majority share of Facebook stock, but his stock is like a super voting rights and he's the only one that has them. So I think for every share that he has, it's worth like a thousand shares. And so he has more votes than everybody else. So there's a difference again between equity and kind of like voting rights and kind of like borders and all that stuff. So the show doesn't even kind of like get that right on like how these things kind of like work. There's two goals. One is um, you should always be able to break stalemates. So if it's kind of like, even if it's like 30, 30, 30, right? There's two people who are voting for, one person against, so you can kind of like break break stalemates. If it's two people, you want like 51, 49 at least, right? So you kind of like know who has the last um, say. And then I think the other thing that most people don't understand as well is for a company that does really well, your equity share gets diluted a lot, right? Like you'll go from 50 to like five. So if you don't start with 50, you'll end up with much less than five. And at some point in your company cycle, you'll be like, wait, I have what? 1% of a not even billion dollar company? Is this like worth my time? And so you'll get into the situation where something needs to happen, right? And someone needs to give up something. And most of the time it's investors giving up something. And so those types of things will sometimes kill companies because no one's motivated enough to, to have enough of the pie where they're, they're making enough money. I mean, like most, like most movies, right? There's like some shred of truth and this, this happens all the time. So when you're in a team, especially of, I don't know, more than three people, maybe even two people, like you'll constantly have, or I think the biggest issue is you constantly, you can't operate without like having set in stone kind of like how you guys want to distribute equity. And it's probably like one of the hardest ways to do it. For all the founders kind of like out there, when you find yourself in situations like this, you need to do what you think is right. Like this guy's kind of coming in strong, like you can't do this or whatever, whatever. That's okay. That is his opinion. And you're going to get investors that are like, hey, that's that's kind of their opinion. And look, I've told my opinion to kind of other founders. But the thing you always need to remember is that you are the founders of the company and you need to do what you think is right. That doesn't mean you like don't listen and you don't pay attention or whatever. And so if I, you know, way back when, when I, we were starting out, if an investor told me this, what I would probably advise myself to have done is go talk to other investors to see if there's truth to this, try to get an understanding of it, and like try to see if maybe this was something that we kind of missed. But if you get other kind of views from other people and that it's like not necessarily kind of like that bit of a thing or like maybe it's just not that big of a deal, then, you know, maybe sometimes you stick to your guns and you're like, look, we think that we're kind of like both equally important to this and we're going to have kind of like equal share. And you can go back to the investor. And I know this is like there's a lot of kind of power dynamics here, but you can go back to the investor and be like, that's how we want it. So are you in or are you out? Right? Like if you don't agree with this, then don't invest. But this is the way that we're going to kind of like do things. And so I think that's like a really important point that like, don't have investors kind of like bully you or push you into this stuff because they quote unquote kind of like know better. And we tell our companies all this kind of the same. I think that's the first thing we kind of one of the first things we say at orientation is like, we're going to give you a lot of advice and we have lots of opinions, but you're the founder at the end of the day and you need to kind of like make your own decisions. <laughs>
This is why I've always stayed away from taking money from kind of like parents or kind of like family members and that kind of stuff. Short story here is that my parents wanted to invest in Brian and I's first company and I told them no. And they were actually kind of like sad about it because they felt like they wanted to like support their son and I wasn't letting them and all this kind of stuff. And so, but I basically kind of stayed away from it. And it's partly for this kind of like reason. Um, they didn't really know much about kind of venture investing. They didn't really kind of know about kind of like what we were doing or anything like that. And I think a, a lot of times we tell kind of like founders too to like, don't take money from people who have aren't venture investors and kind of not familiar with startups and haven't done it before. And there's a couple of reasons for this. One is they're not going to really understand what you're going to like do. Two, they are not going to really understand how startups work. And so, you know, the dad kept being like, give me assurances and like, there's no assurances in startups. Right. And so, I mean, the son could have said something, but there's no assurances in startups. Right. And so I think that's problematic. And then again, I think like, startup, there's just a lot of risk involved with it. And so, you know, I, I always tell founders, I wouldn't take money from people who haven't invested in startups before, or don't have a lot of money. Because I think if they don't understand, and they give you kind of like a fair bit of their like net worth, you're only asking for problems. And what they end up doing a lot of times is kind of this, I've seen some bad cases where, I don't know, somebody, let's say you raised like a million dollars and I don't know, some investor gave you like 15,000, which isn't a, a lot in the million dollars, but maybe it's a lot to them. And they kind of are like, they are the ones that bother you the most. They are the ones that show up to your office to explain these things. And it's like, it just kind of gets in the way of kind of like what you're needing to do. Not that investors don't have a right to kind of ask questions and stuff, but there's productive ways to do it. And so you want to be mindful of kind of like picking your investors here. I think this stuff kind of like does happen, maybe not like this, maybe not with kind of parents, but it definitely does happen if you take money from people who are like, maybe can't really afford it or don't really understand what's happening. <laughs> On the first point, I think it's important, right, that you kind of like figure out what your differentiation is. And for me, I would have just dug in li a little bit deeper on like, oh, what is the actual differentiation? A lot of founders actually know how they're different than other kind of like uh, companies. And so like if they have an answer, I think that one's kind of like fine. Just like not that big of a deal. On the API cost thing, I think what's interesting is a lot of companies, um, it doesn't matter. <laughs> like, if a lot of people are using you for some reason, like your, your, that's the thing that people are looking for is, uh, your kind of like customer demand is very high. Uh, and so API costs can go down, uh, or you can figure out a way to monetize it in such a way that, um, like the economics work. Maybe kind of like what I would say is like both of those points aren't enough to shut down an idea or a company. Investors care about money. So, <laughs> so I think the, the concept that you can like tell a really great story and then someone's going to like believe you and give you money for it is just false. And so I think the kind of like startup advisor here is right, which is you can tell the greatest story you want. You might be able to get the initial like 500K, maybe like a million dollars because like someone actually cares at kind of like a family office, but to build a real business, like, you need to show real dollar signs and real customer demand. They're both wrong, but they have the best intentions. That device is amazing. I want, uh, <laughs> I give her credit. That was like a very savvy way to like turn the pitch around. So <laughs> if someone did that to me and I was like this, I'd be like, okay, you, you got me. You got me. <laughs> Uh, 
뭐, 둘친다 경량화랑 사람 인식 기술이 이슈잖아요. 똑같은 사양으로 테스트를 해보면 어느 쪽 성능이 더 좋은지 답이 나올 것 같아. Okay, it's a hundred percent not common because this never happens. Never happens. But I think it's again, like it's just so great. It's like a such a great like Korean drama <laughs> edition. Uh, I think maybe the reason why it doesn't happen that often, right, is because companies usually don't do exactly the same thing <laughs> with like exactly the same technology and then like call each other out on it. Uh, but. I would love it for that to happen in real life. <laughs> I think it's just, it's so good. 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 I think it's just, it's so This 100% happens. <laughs> and so almost all acquires are typically engineers. You'll see almost all the time that there's some negotiated kind of like um, earn out or contract for business people because acquires aren't like a good acquisition. Right. It's basically you're hiring talent into your company. And so I, I think my reaction is this happens all the time and it's kind of like um, their fault for not kind of like realizing what's happening uh, on the deal. Um, maybe the thing I'd say is um, the deals are actually laid out very concretely. And so like you'll know, you'll interview everyone, you'll know kind of like um, how much each person is going to get, what level they are, what is their compensation, how long they stay at the company, which team they're going to be, how the transition is going to work, what the penalty is that they're going to pay. And so I just think That scene would never happen unless you're like really, like, I don't know, <laughs> living under a rock for the entire time that the acquisition was happening. Yeah, it's a great scene, but would never happen in real life. But the, the contracts do look that way for an acquirer. You're talking to like a company to acquire your entire company. It's like life changing enough, right? That you're probably spending at the, a minimum like three or four weeks going through diligence and legal contracts and what's actually going to happen and all that kind of stuff. It, it's like most acquisitions, even if they're acquire, is like a very considered decision. And so, yeah, you would never sit down and just sign a piece of paper. That's why you want good legal counsel, right, on both sides to kind of like help you figure out what's the, what are the terms that actually matter and what's, what are the consequences of kind of like things you're, you're doing. Also, like with most of these things, um, it gets negotiated back and forth multiple times before kind of like actual signing takes place. Get a good lawyer, go talk to your other founder friends, right, who have been through transactions before and uh, you'll be, you'll be fine. I think in conclusion, things are very entertaining, but incredibly inaccurate. <laughs> With every single scene, there's maybe like 1% shred of truth, and then everything's built to be very entertaining. So love watching. I think Hollywood does a great job, but real startup life is quite different. I think the thing that people watching these shows uh, need to be mindful of is, and especially if you're interested in being a startup founder or working in startups, is that they most of the time don't get the details right. And so I wouldn't watch these shows and kind of like think like, oh, this is how it's going to be, or this is how it works, or by no means take advice from any of the shows. And so I think it's actually the onus is on the audience to watch these shows, enjoy them. And you know maybe they kind of get you to think about a startup or the tech industry as kind of a whole, but like don't take any of the kind of like details kind of seriously. Actually look them up, talk to people who are in the industry and they can kind of pretty quickly kind of point you in the right direction. Um, so yeah, not their fault to kind of get it right. Um, you know, I think if you're watching these shows, you know, you got to do a little bit of homework to kind of see if it's real or not. Um, and if you're just watching for entertainment, have fun, enjoy yourself. Don't do any of the homework. Rather than heating an entire room, human heater is a microwave technology that can heat the surface of a person's skin instead. Trust me, it is very, very safe. I don't trust you, and it can't be safe. Let me just demonstrate it to assure you. No, 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 no. no. It is a great idea to use, because on one hand, it is ridiculous, but there, on one hand, it's like, it kind of makes some sense. Like, I was thinking about it, and I was like, Oh, yeah, you know, like, I'm heating my whole place right now, 
But really, all I care about is, like, hating me. A lot of times, the, like, craziest ideas of, I don't know, microwaving human skin, right, is are the ideas that actually pan out to be, like, real. So, I was like, oh, heat people's skin? That makes perfect sense. Do you know what's funny? Sukin said the exact same thing. Really? 